The FCC has fined Dish Network $150,000 for failing to dispose of a satellite. What? Here's the deal. EchoStar 7 was a communications satellite launched in 2002. It was supposed to have about a 12-year lifespan. Different things sort of limit how long a satellite can live. Sometimes it's the breakdown of the components over time, exposed to the vacuum of space. Sometimes it's radiation slowly breaking things down. Sometimes it's just the advent of new and better technologies. I mean, how many of you are still using a cell phone that you got in the year 2000? But a lot of the times, the limiting factor to the lifetime of a satellite is the amount of fuel it carries. See, a satellite has to use the fuel to sort of stay in its location. It's in orbit, it's just sort of floating around, but it needs little adjustments, little bumps on occasion, just to make sure it stays in the right spot. Now, in the case of Echo Star 7, the problem was fuel. Now, they expected the satellite to be done around 2014. But come 2012, Dish Network asked the FCC for an extension to the contract. In fact, they wanted to operate that same satellite for another 10 years. Now, as part of that, they said, trust me, bro, in another 10 years, we'll still be able to dispose of the satellite as per the plan. Now, there's different ways we get rid of satellites. I mean, sometimes we just let them burn up in the atmosphere or crash them to the ocean. In fact, there's a place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called the South Pacific Oceanic Uninhabited Area, or Point Nemo, that's basically a satellite graveyard. It's just the farthest you can get away from land or inhabited areas, where if you crash your satellite there, you're probably not gonna hit anything. But the orbits of some satellites are so high that it doesn't make sense to carry enough fuel to slow them back down so they hit the atmosphere and crash or burn up. These satellites we send into what are called graveyard orbits. It basically means we're just getting it out of the lane so it's not causing problems with other traffics. And Echo Star 7 was bound for a graveyard orbit. Per the license, they were supposed to send the satellite into an orbit that was 300 kilometers higher than the orbit it was operating in, sort of getting it out of the way when they're done with it. And so the FCC said, sure, all right, here's an extension, continue operating the satellite, but you still have to clean it up when you're done. Years go by, the satellite beams satellite pictures down to your TV, Dish Network makes a bunch of money, and then in 2022, they tell the satellite they want it to move a little bit. Normal thing, just to keep it where it needs to be to operate. But when they did that, it didn't move as much as they expected. Come to find out, they were running low on fuel. Now, it's pretty tough to make an accurate fuel gauge in space. It can't work like your car gas tank with a little float valve or an electronic sensor that requires all the fuel to be settled into the bottom of the tank. Gravity does that for you. In an orbit, you don't have that. You also can't just weigh the fuel like you might do like a propane tank for your grill, right? Again, you need gravity to weigh it. So what satellite operators will do is they'll say, okay, every time I turn on the thruster, it uses this amount of fuel in this amount of time, and I just fired the thruster for this many seconds, so I just use this amount of fuel. You add that up over time, and you end up with a pretty good estimation of how much fuel you've used. You double the operating life of the satellite, and the things that varied a little bit start to vary even more. On top of that, as the equipment ages, it may not use the fuel as efficiently. It may take more fuel to get the same uh, movement of the satellite. Not exactly what happened here, but imagine a leaky thruster being in the cold, dark depths of space for 20 years. Originally, they had calculated that they would need 11 kilograms of propellant to move the satellite from its operational orbit to its graveyard orbit. Now, they thought they didn't have that much. So they went ahead and they tried to shut it down and sort of pull it off to the side of the road. But when they did, they could only get it 122 kilometers above the operational orbit. Now, the problem with that is they were granted the license and they said that they would make sure that they got it to 300 kilometer different of an orbit when they were done with it. They failed to do that. So they had to tell the FCC that they had failed to comply with the license. So think of it like this. You've, you've got some trash and you like ball it up and you shoot it at the bin in the corner and you miss, right? Well, space is big. Why not just leave it there? Well, that's the same as you leaving the trash on your floor. And then later when you come around, you trip on it and you face plant into the desk. Best to just clean it up. Orbital collusions are a lot worse than face plants. <laughs> That's sort of what's happening here. They tried to dispose of it, but they fell short of the mark. Now, there's no space AAA you can just call out to have them tow your satellite out of the way. And on top of that, the satellite is 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth, moving 7,000 miles per hour. It's a little tough to get to. But most importantly, Echo Star 7 was in a geosynchronous slot. If you have a communication satellite and you want to, say, beam TV down to North America, it doesn't do you good when your satellite's on the other side of the planet. There are only specific orbits where a satellite can sort of stay above one part of the surface of the Earth. Those are called geosynchronous or geostationary orbits. But in order for those to work, in order for the satellite to sort of stay above North America, it has to be at a very specific altitude going a very specific speed. I mean, what's actually happening is the planet is rotating at the same speed that the satellite is orbiting, so the satellite stays above one spot, right? 
This is the moon. If you've got a dead satellite that's in that spot, you can't put a new fresh satellite there. And if you have a dead satellite that's crossing through that spot, well, same problem. The other problem with geosynchronous is that it's 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. If we leave something in low Earth orbit, four or 500 miles, eventually the atmospheric drag will pull it back down out of space. I mean, there's still enough atmosphere down there to slow down a satellite such that it falls out of orbit. Even the International Space Station has to boost its orbit on occasion just to make sure it stays in space. It's not a conspiracy, it's physics. But up at geosynchronous altitudes, there's almost no atmospheric drag, and it may be tens to hundreds of thousands of years before something will actually come down out of an orbit like that. If you leave your trash around, it's probably going to be around for a long time. So it's important for us to clean up space junk. It's really important for us to clean up these geosynchronous slots. Now, the FCC turns around and said that's not good and started to enter an investigation into what happened. The end of it was a settlement. And in the settlement, a couple things happened. Number one, Dish Network was fined $150,000. Is it really that big of a deal? Is that going to deter a satellite operation from doing anything? Well, the satellites and the launches cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And in 2022, Dish Network reported $16.68 billion in revenue. $150,000 is almost a rounding error to them. I mean, it's like if you made $50,000 and somebody gave you a parking fine for 45 cents, is that going to keep you from parking there? So why bother? Well, it's not just about the money. Dish Network also had to admit fault, which is basically putting down in writing that they didn't take the appropriate steps to make sure that they could continue to comply with the license when they asked for the extension. They knew they had limited fuel, and that extended operating period meant that they may not have enough left to decommission the satellite correctly. And now they're going to need to not only make sure that future satellites are better tracked when it comes to the fuel and their ability to be cleaned up, they also need to review their existing fleet to make sure they can continue to comply with the license. But even beyond that, this first fine for orbital littering, basically, right, failure to comply with the license, shows that the FCC is keeping track. And why is that important? Just because space is outside of the environment doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of it. If you've heard of Kessler syndrome, where one piece of space junk crashes into another, that crashes into another, that crashes into more, more, causing a huge chain reaction, we've got to make sure we never let it get out of hand. I mean, we have within our power right now the ability to render entire regions of space completely worthless because we fill them with junk. So making sure we have a plan to clean up unused satellites is pretty important. But why is the FCC involved? Well, if you want to put up a satellite, you usually need to be able to talk to the satellite, and that requires frequencies, which are licensed by the FCC. But here with satellites, not only are they looking out for the, let's say, clarity of the airwaves, they're also looking out for the clarity of the space that the equipment operates in. And that's why this is a big deal. $150,000 drop in the bucket when it comes to operating a satellite. But when you have to apply for a license to be able to make that satellite useful, and you prove that maybe you're not going to be trustworthy when it comes to cleaning up your toys after you use them to make up a bunch of money, maybe it's good that we have somebody looking out for space junk and, for the first time ever, proving they're serious about it with this fine and settlement issued towards Dish Network. I'm John Galloway for NSF. We'll see you nerds later.